So delighted to welcome initially Dr. Marietta Sadler, who's going to be speaking on the tide is coming in. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to showcase some very collaborative research that is currently ongoing in the diabetes and mental health interface. I'm a diabetologist and clinical researcher over at KCL and KCH, and we're working collaboratively um, with your team. So the tide is coming in. Um, it's the title, for, so the abbreviation for type one diabetes and disordered eating. Um, why are we showcasing this here? It's a very complex but quite common problem, unfortunately, for people living with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition where the autoimmune destruction of beta cells leads to absolute deficiency of the anabolic hormone insulin, which the person living with type 1 diabetes has to substitute and manage lifelong to be able to be well. So diabetes management puts a huge focus on body weight and shape, food intake, carbohydrate content, exercise and all that. So it's not surprising that conventional eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorders are twice as common in people living with type 1 diabetes. However, there is a very specific behaviour only people with type 1 diabetes can um, have, which is restricting or not taking the anabolic hormone insulin in order to control their weight. So we need to expand the definition of tight, type 1 diabetes disordered eating, to those who restrict or omit their insulin to influence weight and shape. And that's likely going to be about a third of the clinic population we're seeing, the other population we're seeing of women, and 7 to 10 percent of men. Um, so as part of this work, we've proposed uh, criteria for TIDE, so that is having type 1 diabetes, having a pervasive fear of insulin as weight gaining and restricting or omitting insulin in some form. Um, restricting of insulin is a very dangerous thing to do um, because running blood glucose levels high longer term drives chronic complications of diabetes such as renal, eye complications, heart attacks and so on. So we see accelerated late complications unfortunately in this group of people but also acute complications of type 1 diabetes such as diabetic ketoacidosis or severe hypoglycemia if insulin is overdosed. So just for illustration, I've brought along a glucose um, sensor download of a person living with type 1 diabetes and disordered eating. It looks very chaotic, it is chaotic, um, which we call high glycemic viability, as in huge glucose swings up and down. The green zone you see is the target range between 4 and um, 10, um, but you can see if a person engages in insulin emission restriction, you see all these red and yellow dots on the graph. And unfortunately, this is all the drive of high mortality in this group of people. So what are we doing about this? Um, we are collaboratively working on two complex interventions for TIDE in the clinical academic synergy we have here at King's Health Partners. One is the STEADY project. STEADY stands for, stands for a safe management of people with type 1 diabetes and eating disorder study. It's an outpatient based intervention for the moderately ill. Um, it's funded by my NHR Clinician Scientist Fellowship. In parallel, we are developing the um, NHS England funded pilot service, Pan London, to develop a service of people with severe tides. So these, this is a group of people with chronically high H1Cs, recurrent DKAs or severe hypos and very low body mass index. And these really feed off each other, these two projects. So I'm starting with STEADY. Um, it's a real team effort of a um, multidisciplinary team with a very broad skill set um, with a mentorship support across um, King's Health Partners. And what we've been up to in the last five years was really going back to the drawing board, refining and developing theoretical models of tide maintenance and recovery, asking the people who live with tide and who have recovered from it in semi-structured interviews and developing a model. So I'm just putting the papers here if you wanted to read it up further. Um, we've gone um, to ask people who normally don't take part in research, um, people who author blogs on diabulimia, so diabulimia is another term for, for tides, specific in the, the variation of tide where people don't take much of their insulin. Um, we've asked healthcare teams um, about their challenges and therapeutic strategies in treating tide. 
um, in focus groups and we have um, done a mixed methods project on trying to understand how glucose ups and downs feed into diabetes self-care behavior, emotion and physical symptoms and vice versa in people with tired. So I'm just sh showing, showcasing a few snippets of these publications. For example, um, we've been able to demonstrate that having tired means that you have higher glycemic variability, um, blood glucose in the higher range, um, and we also were able to picture um, how different the phenotypes of tide can present themselves clinically. So if you look at the left panel, these are the glucose monitoring traces. This is a, a little device that sits in the subcutaneous tissue that men, measures glucose in the interstitial tissue every five minutes. And, and if you line them up, you get a line per each day. If you look at the very left of that left panel, you see two lines going up steeply. So this is nocturnal binge eating shown in the glucose trace of this um, research participant. And very different picture on the right. This is a young woman who purges through glucosuria. So if you run your blood glucose very high, you're going to lose glucose via the kidneys and therefore eliminate calories and glucose. And also the metabolism switches into a catabolic state, which also leads to breakdown um, of protein and fat and glycogen. So we're looking at a very diverse group of people here. Um, one snippet from the um, theoretical models of maintenance and recovery. Insulin emission doesn't equal insulin emission. So the different maintenance cycles that drive people to emit their insulin. For example, the fear of insulin as weight gaining. Insulin equals pure fat. For example, the cycle that is called insulin emission is my magic weight loss tool, coming back to that uniqueness of living with type 1 diabetes and being able to omit insulin. Insulin emission as addictive behavior is very difficult to treat because high blood glucose levels seem to numb emotions and feelings to some degree, so it's very difficult to get back into taking insulin again if um, some emotions and feeling come back. Um, not injecting insulin for binges or for food means that food doesn't count. Then there's the cycle, insulin emission gives me control over, over my diabetes. That's quite paradoxical, so I need to explain that. So, so the, the feeling of having to look after one's diabetes all day long can be very frustrating, can feel uh, like a lack of control over one's diabetes. And so if you invert that, not taking insulin gives a sense of control because that's something one can control. And what all these maintenance cycles have in common is the immense fear of taking the first step of insulin titration. So we've taken all this material to experience-based multidisciplinary co-design workshops with people with lived experience, health professionals, several are in the room today, thank you. <laughs> um, and we, in an iterative process, we developed this complex intervention, which is a modular intervention with a toolkit where we can tailor the intervention to the participant, but it works to a cognitive behavioral change strategy framework and combines diabetes education and diabetes physiology with that. <laughs> um, owing to COVID, we've had to digitalize it all and have got a, a steady app and a digital health platform with that. And we are now in the feasibility trial stage of it. So we've randomized 40 participants into steady intervention versus usual care. We had to ad adjust the trial design due to the exciting changes in the diabetes technology landscape that was happening in the background. So we're now including also people with a very low, with lower HPNC. Um, and we are currently collecting the follow-up data. So watch that space. Um, so the other big endeavor is the Pan-London Tide Collaborative. Um, almost impossible to fit everybody onto this slide. So it's a huge effort um, in terms of stakeholdership, in terms of actual clinical work, and it all happens in the midst of a pandemic. So this service is catering to people with severe tired um, and is run in a hub and spoke model with the um, hub at King's College Hospital, um, also jointly with the SLAM and the eating disorder unit, inpatients and outpatient facilities and catering to all five ICBs. I think they're now called all five regions across London. Um, just a, a quick snippet because um, I think that shows very nicely the joint work between diabetes physicians, eating disorder, inpatient specialists and so on. So this is a young woman who was an inpatient in the Bethlehem eating disorder unit um, with severe anorexia 
and she needed to get fit for dental surgery and needed to gain some weight. And we were working jointly with remote glucose monitoring um, by our team. We were advising in a dose adjustment of the um, long acting insulin, it's called Degladec. Uh, and you can see how, how um, that is illustrated here on, on, on this graph and, um, and how that interface works really well, particularly with the modern diabetes technologies. This has been quite a successful pilot um, in terms of biomedical outcomes as well. So we we're able to more than half the admissions in diabetic ketoacidosis. It was health economically viable um, and H1C was reduced from 11.8 to 10.2. So H1C is the currency diabetologists work in. So it is a surrogate marker for long term glycemia and also links well into um, future diabetes um, complications. And we've been working very closely with this team here with our inpatient admissions, some of them on the section two. And the key achievements were that we could prove the concept that you can integrate a mind and body model across London. Um, we've created some evidence base of improved health, care and economic outcomes. And um, we've of course audited all and have done some longitudinal observations. And again, this is all work in progress. I think one of the most important outcomes here is the raising awareness, but also providing some clarity on diagnostic criteria because this is not reflected in DSM-5 or ICD-11 at the moment. So this is the first national guidance under the umbrella of the Royal College of Psychiatry, um, really led by Dr. Simon Chapman. And then the two teams, the, the Pandanant team is led by Professor Khalida Ismail, and the Wessex pilot team is um, led by Dr. Helen Partridge. So, so, so all these teams fed into these first national guidances, which you can read up here. Again, trying to bring in the solidify the criteria for TIDE and also giving some recommendations on um, severity, uh, stratification and management. Um, yeah, and of course, thank you very much to the entire study team and collaborative. So it's, it's not just the team, but also all the people who supported it. The TIDE, the Pandanan team and collaborative, all the research participants and our co-designers with lived experience. And thank you for listening and I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you. Just any questions or instructors? Yeah, thank you. No, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Yes. I didn't just wait for the microphone. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering if there's any research on insulin pumps and whether they might be protective against the development of these sort of restrictive eating behaviors. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. I might just take this one so I'm not in your way. Thank you. That's a very, very good question because diabetes technology um, is there and we're glad it's there and it's, it's bit of a double-edged sword. So you can also not give your insulin with an insulin pump. So it doesn't matter which modality a person uses to take their insulin. It can be an insulin pen or it can be an insulin pump. We have good people who in our service who just took off the pump for eight hours after their dinner in order to not put on the calories of the dinner, for example. But that said, um, it is really a case-by-case -case basis. So we are now really delighted to have the hybrid closed loop system so that's the uh, it's called also called artificial pancreas where you link the glucose sensor with an algorithm and an insulin pump in a sort of closed cycle um, where the person wearing that technology still announces i'm exercising i'm going to eat something but it does take a lot of the burden off a lot of the mental burden of living with diabetes which does free up some headspace to engage in therapy for example um, um, so we have so several we have participants in our steady study who are on hybrid closed loops. Um, it is new territory for us to have them in that therapy and, and we're learning with them. So um, yeah, so it doesn't prevent eating disorder, um, but it is something that needs to be integrated in whichever intervention we're delivering. We've got a question at the back. <coughs> Thank you. Great presentation. I wanted to ask you about the guidelines that you showed us. Um, is that for psychiatrists, assuming that it's um, run by the Royal College of Psychiatrists, or was that created for primary care practitioners as they deal with day-to-day -day management? 
That's again a very good question. So, so in a, in a way, we wanted to get this into a channel to <laughs> raise awareness on it. Um, it I think it's, it can be broadly used. Um, the problem is that in that guideline, we're of course describing an ideal world where we have got joined up services that are well funded, where the eating disorder team works with the diabetes team and vice versa, where they know each other, they work jointly and don't give conflicting messages to the same person with the condition, but it is a start. So, so we have to start, it's a bit like a white paper, you put something in a guideline and then you can implement it in the various trusts and say, well, that's the guidelines. Why do we not have a psychologist um, working in our diabetes team? Or why do we not have a physician visiting our inpatient eating disorder facility to help us with this and so on? So, yeah. Did you have any primary care collaborators on the guidelines? Um, I think we did. I think we did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't name them there at the moment. Any other questions? Marika. Hi, um, I loved your talk and I wondered, would you tell us a bit more about your steady app? Steady app. <laughs> um, thank you. So the steady app is um, trying to combine the diabetes documentation. So a person living with diabetes has to document things around glucose levels, how much insulin have they given, what was the carb content of the meal. And for a CBT, you also need to document, for example, the therapy goal was reducing that fear of the first insulin injection in the morning. So what was it today? Was it a seven? Was it a six or was it a 10? So we're trying to bring these two together in that app. Um, so the participant can then share their documentation with their therapist. But we've also got um, information material which gets released by the steady therapist, for example, um, on managing low blood sugar levels in a way that a low blood sugar doesn't lead to a binge eating episode. Um, or so it does come with educational material which is released in a bespoke way. But it is not the intervention per se. It is the vehicle that helps the communication between therapist and participant and helps distribute the material and and um, help with the documentation and it's quite people like it because it's discreet to do that on an app rather than with a piece of paper and you get do you get good compliance right yeah um, yes and no <laughs> so the app deck has been mixed for the app so there's some some participants who really like using it and others who who prefer to go back to paper based or perhaps don't document at all and that's fine too so sometimes a therapy goal can be reflecting about the diabetes self-management a bit more and then you start from somebody not using the app at all and then perhaps putting a few data points in but with the glucose sensors, we can also access various cloud platforms that people can share with us, whether, for example, share their glucometer download with us, which you can access on the cloud and we don't necessarily need the app. So um, we will see whether that will be part of the, the, the larger scale RCT, but but I hope so, because, because I think what the app would really need is a push notification system, which you don't have at the moment to prompt and remind people. <laughs> Thank you. Last question here, if we can get a mark across. <coughs> Thank you, that was a really lovely talk. Um, I wonder how recent are the guidelines <coughs> and has there been any move to um, the training, say, of medical students and other disciplines in this kind of integrated care? Agree, so, so it has to start with training people um, in, in all segments of the healthcare really because because it can be a root cause to developing the problem so hearing in a and e or a frequent flyer or you again or have you not taken your insulin again and um so so it really starts in med school in um also registrar training for example the um association for british diabetologists has now a clinical workshop on, on diabetes and mental health and also one on diabetes and into um, eating disorders as part of their curriculum, um, which is new and it is met with ambivalence and it's, it, there's a lot of work to do, but also, um, you, know, you know, all of us learning more about it as, as we go along. Agree. Okay, so a guideline is nice, but if, if, if the broader community isn't aware of the problem and doesn't know how to deal with it, then, then yeah. <laughs> Um, I think May 22, right? Oh, 
Yeah. yeah. They're quite recent. Yeah. Thank you so much again. Thank you.